This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices. Well, thank you everyone for signing in for this week's Money Talks Zoom lecture. I'm very grateful to the ANS Executive Director, Gilles Chamberlain, for the opportunity to speak to you. To be honest, I have always wanted to give a Money Talks, but due to my location in Canada, it has not been possible in the past. However, now that we are all confined to our homes, Zoom offers this chance for today. Over the course of the next hour, I would like to introduce you to the coinage of the Seleucid Empire, a Hellenistic state that ruled over much of the Near East, Iran, and Central Asia for almost 250 years, from 312 to 64 BC. And to illustrate for you the ways in which the coins tell stories about the kings, and engage in political and cultural conversations involving both ruler and ruled. With only a few exceptions, the vast majority of the Seleucid coins that I will show you today come from the society's world-renowned collection, which can now be studied along with Seleucid coins of other major institutional collections at Seleucid Coins Online, which is part of the larger ANS Hellenistic Royal Coinages Project headed by Peter Van Alphen and Ethan Gruber. Before we begin though, it's very important that you take this opportunity to run out to the kitchen and grab that warm glass of milk, then sit back, relax, and even tuck yourself in if you like. It's story time. Once upon a time, there was a young man from Macedonia named Seleucus went off to seek his fortune in the army of Alexander the Great. Although he rose to the position of commander of the royal Hypaspists, when Alexander died in 323 BC, he did not receive any territory of his own in the settlement between the generals that followed. However, in a second settlement three years later, Seleucus was appointed satrap of Babylonia. Despite ongoing struggles between Alexander's generals, Seleucus managed to govern his satrapy without serious incident until 315, when his formerly friendly relationship with Antigonus, the ambitious strategos of Asia, fell apart. When Antigonus arrived in Babylonia at the head of a large army and demanded an account of the satrapy's administration, Seleucus could see the writing on the wall. He assembled a small group of his closest companions and fled to Babylonia excuse me, and fled Babylonia to seek the safety of Egypt and the court of Ptolemy, another of Alexander's former generals. After spending the next few years serving as a naval commander for Ptolemy against Antigonus, in 312, Seleucus returned to Babylonia. And within a year, he had also expanded his influence over neighboring Persis, Susiana, and Media. Following a failed attempt by Antigonus to drive Seleucus out of Babylonia again, between 307 and 305, Seleucus undertook a great campaign to conquer the Eastern satrapies as far as the borders of India. These conquests gained for Seleucus not only the largest territorial empire of any of Alexander's successors, but also a powerful weapon, a herd of 500 war elephants from the Mauryan Emperor Chandragupta. Flushed with these successes and continuing the rivalry with Antigonus, late in 305 BC, Seleucus proclaimed himself king in his own territory. Seleucus soon thereafter joined a coalition of fellow kings, including his old friend Ptolemy, Cassander of Macedon, and Lysimachus of Thrace, in a bid to end the threat of Antigonus to all of their kingdoms. The forces of the coalition met those of Antigonus at Ipsus in Phrygia in 301 BC. 
There, Antigonus was defeated and killed in no small part due to the actions of Seleucus and his son, Antiochus. It is in the context of the struggle against Antigonus and the years that followed his destruction that the coins of Seleucus begin to tell stories about their issuer through their types and symbols. A prominent feature of Seleucus coinage is the frequent use of an anchor. It occurs occasionally as a full reverse type as here, but most commonly as a supplementary symbol or a countermark. Several stories reported in the histories of Appian and Justin account for the close association of Seleucus with the anchor. According to Appian, writing in the second century AD, when Seleucus was about to set out to reclaim Babylonia in 312, he stumbled on a stone. When it was dug up, the stone was discovered to be an anchor. The soothsayers understood this omen as a warning of delay, but Ptolemy, who was also present, interpreted it as a sign of security for the expedition. Thus, following Seleucus's return to power in Babylonia, he is said to have made the anchor the seal on his signet ring. Justin tells an even more incredible story in which Seleucus was not the biological son of his human parents, Laodice and Antiochus, but of the god Apollo and Laodice. The god reportedly visited Laodice one night in a dream and left behind an iron ring as a token of the true parentage of the son she would bear. When Seleucus had grown to adulthood and was preparing to march east with Alexander, Laodice gave him the ring, which was engraved with an anchor. In a variant of this story told by Appian, it was foretold that Seleucus would rule in the land wherever he lost the ring. He later lost it on the banks of the Euphrates River and therefore came to be the ruler of Babylonia, as well as other lands east of the Euphrates. All of these stories are remarkable and clearly invented in order to explain the connection between Seleucus and anchors that is so clear from the coinage. Appian's story regarding Seleucus stumbling on a stone anchor, however, seems a little ridiculous, since such anchors, which have been used in the Mediterranean from the Bronze Age to the late Middle Ages, look nothing like the more modern looking two-armed anchor on Seleucid coins. The story of the signet ring as a token of parentage and the omen of its loss features popular plot elements found in the myth of Theseus, Herodotus' story of Polycrates of Samos, and in Attic New Comedy. However, the explanations given by Appian and Justin all agree on one thing. The anchor served as Seleucus' seal emblem from early in his reign if not already prior to his rise to power in Babylonia. This fact seems to be borne out by the use of the anchor as a subsidiary symbol on coins struck beginning immediately after Seleucus returned to Babylonia in 312 BC and continuing throughout his reign, as if he were guaranteeing the coins with his own seal. That the anchor actually served as a Seleucid royal seal device is beyond question in light of the existence of seal impressions from Uruk and Seleucia on the Tigris under Antiochus I, which feature the anchor alongside a cuneiform inscription that explicitly describing it in Akkadian as the seal of the king. The seal impression, uh, in the seal impression here, the anchor can be seen above the animal. I hope you can make it out here. It's, it's rather poorly preserved. The anchor can be seen above an animal, which has been variously interpreted by Assyriologists as a lion or a horse. Uh, in my opinion, it looks rather more like a horse than a lion, but it is, it is poorly preserved, as you can see. Um, a similar arrangement involving a lion occurs on Seleucus's Babylonian staters which ceased production around 305 BC, 
while anchors with horses occur somewhat later, as on the tetradram series of Ekbatana, shown here. The image of a horse, most commonly reduced to a head or forepart, also appears with some frequency as a type and a subsidiary symbol on coins of Seleucus, beginning with some of the Alexandrine issues of Asusa in 305 BC. I think you can make out the head here. And continuing also until the end of his reign. Uh, further examples include this bronze issue from Apamea in Syria, uh, this Eastern issue, and this wonderful coin from Pergamum, uh, which I would argue is one of the finest renderings of an animal on a Greek coin. A curious feature of most of these depictions is the addition of a pair of bull's horns to the head. These horns link the horse to the depiction of a helmeted head variously identified as Alexander the Great or Seleucus, shown wearing a horned helmet on coins struck at Susa. A rare issue from Ekbatana puts both horse and the wear of the horned helmet together on the same reverse. Those scholars who consider the helmeted head to be that of Alexander have identified the horse as the famous Bucephalus or ox head arguing that the coins serve to symbolically represent the name. Although this does not explain the horned helmet, which is never part of Alexander's iconography elsewhere. Instead, it seems most likely that the horse is actually the unnamed but beloved steed of Seleucus, who was honored at Antioch with a peculiar gilded statue group consisting of the head of a horse and a helmet. This group seems to have given the name of Hippocephalus to the surrounding Antiochian neighborhood. According to John Malalas, a Byzantine chronographer of the sixth century AD, this horse was so honored because it had carried Seleucus to safety when he escaped from Antigonus in 315 and again to victory at the Battle of Ipsus in 301. Due to the story behind it, the horse seemed as a suitable emblem of Seleucus as the victorious king. The addition of the bull's horns seems to be a visual indicator that the horse is specifically that belonging to Seleucus. They also occur on representations of his elephants, and as we shall see, were closely associated with Seleucus personally. Bulls appear on bronze coins at a variety of Seleucid mints after 300 BC. According to Appian, the bull was an emblem of the king's great strength and recounts that on one occasion, while campaigning with Alexander the Great, Seleucus had saved the day when a sacrifice went awry. The bull intended for sacrifice broke free and began to run amok, but Seleucus intervened and wrestled it to the ground with his bare hands before anyone was injured. For this reason, Appian also reports, Statues of Seleucus frequently represented the king with the horns of a bull. This is a great story, but there is good reason to doubt whether the bull coinage of Seleucus was really trying to tell the same one that Appian retails more than 400 years after the fact. Seleucus's most common bull type shows the animal preparing to charge with its head lowered and its tail curling up in the air, as on this, this coin at the right. This is actually an extremely generic type, following a Greek numismatic model that goes back to the end of the fifth century BC and sees most frequent use in the representation of river gods, as on this coin of Thurium. That this riverine aspect was not lost on the engravers of Seleucus bronze coins is also suggested by the existence of a rare bronze issue from Iconum, on which the bull has the face of a man a standard and much more unequivocal method of representing a river god, following the iconography of Achelous, the father of all rivers in Greek mythology. Unfortunately, here it is not possible to fully hear the story that the bronze coins are trying to tell. Although other coins we have already looked at, and the account of Appian, all make it clear that there was a connection between Seleucus and the bull, as a symbol of personal strength and power, there is no obvious explanation for the use of the bull 
with apparent riverine associations on the coins. In addition to the stories about Seleucus related by the coins and by later authors in, re in connection with the types found on them, several issues of Seleucus are also notable for the way in which they engage in a conversation about his contemporaries and his relationship with them. An issue of gold derricks struck at Susa shortly after Seleucus's victory at the Battle of Ipsus depicts the head of Alexander the Great wearing an elephant headdress on the obverse and the figure of Nike, familiar from Alexander's staters, on the reverse. The type served to link Alexander, the ultimate source of legitimacy in the age of the successors, to Seleucus's victory. Plutarch tells us that Seleucus's watchword on the eve of Ipsus was Alexander and victory, the very types that appear here. The victory was also secured with the help of Seleucus's war elephants, which also seemed to be alluded to by Alexander's headdress, although this type was actually an established portrait representing Alexander as the conqueror of the East. In fact, Seleucus was probably exposed to the model for this type during his period of exile at the court of Ptolemy from 315 to 312. His first numismatic appearance was on tetradrams struck by Ptolemy between 320 and 312, and then continued on reduced weight tetradrams until the Ptolemaic reform of 306 that did away with the type for, for silver. That Seleucus's type is modeled on Ptolemy's early tetradrams is suggested by the absence of the scaly aegis high up on the back of the neck, which is a feature of the Alexander portrait on the later issues of Ptolemy. Thus, the typology of Seleucus's derrick would seem to imply a positive relationship, not only with the deified Alexander, but with Ptolemy, a man who had been Seleucus's supporter in his return to Babylonia in 312, and an ally against Antigonus in 301. However, the three-way conversation between Seleucus, Alexander, and Ptolemy, recorded by the derrick, seems to take a decidedly different course only a few years after it was struck. Around 295 BC, Seleucus introduced a vast new silver coinage at Seleucia on the Tigris, Susa, and Iconum, featuring the head of Zeus on the obverse and a quadriga or biga of elephants on the reverse. This reverse type appears to respond to a slightly earlier series of gold staters struck by Ptolemy that feature Alexander the Great driving a quadriga of elephants on the reverse. However, on the Seleucid reverse, Alexander has been taken out of the driver's seat and been replaced by Athena, while the elephants have been given horns in order to connect them to Seleucus's personal iconography. In essence, the Seleucid die engravers have taken the type of Ptolemy and reworked it to remove its clear Ptolemaic qualities and turn it into a type specifically tied to Seleucus, an act that is suggestive of the souring relationship between Seleucus and Ptolemy after Ipsus. In 301, Ptolemy had been a member of the coalition against Antigonus, but used his troops to pin down Antigonid forces in Phoenicia, while Seleucus and the other allies were fighting Antigonus directly in Western Asia Minor. Once the coalition had achieved victory, those present at the battle disregarded Ptolemy's contribution and agreed that Seleucus should receive Syria, Koile Syria, and Phoenicia as his prize. When Seleucus attempted to claim these territories, he discovered that Ptolemy had already occupied Koile Syria and Phoenicia and had no plans to leave. Seleucus attempted to convince Ptolemy to withdraw, but finally gave up, warning his one time ally that. For friendship's sake, he would not for the present interfere, but will consider later how best to deal with friends who chose to encroach. As it turned out, Seleucus never revisited the question of Phoenicia and Koile Syria before he was assassinated in 280, but it remained a bone of contention between his descendants and those of Ptolemy for almost a century until the region was finally taken from the Ptolemies by Antiochus III in 198. After the death of Seleucus, many of the symbols that had been personal to him in life became enshrined 
or elaborated upon as emblems of the royal dynasty that he founded. The coinage of his successors over time reveals an evolving conversation about relationships between successors and founder, individual kings and dynasty, and even kings and subjects. Probably around 278 BC, Antiochus I began to use the coinage to tell new stories and open new conversations when he introduced the image of a seated Apollo as the standard reverse type for silver coins throughout the Seleucid Empire. Interestingly, the new type does not really try to tell a new story directly about Antiochus, but instead expands on the story of his father as a means of establishing a firm background of legitimacy for himself and the new dynasty. The depiction of Apollo alludes to the story I've already mentioned regarding Seleucus' supposed divine descent, which may have begun to evolve already at the, in the last decade of Seleucus's reign, but probably only reached it, its final form under Antiochus I. Antiochus's image of Apollo seated on the omphalos was not extremely innovative from the Greek perspective. The god could be found in a similar pose atop the navel of the world in a variety of surviving Greek artworks going back to the fifth century BC. These include sculptural reliefs, red figure pottery, and coins like this issue struck by the Amphictyonic League of Delphi. However, in these, the god is usually shown with his kithara and laurel branch. Antiochus' version, however, depicts the god testing an arrow and holding his bow behind him, as if in preparation for a coming battle or hunt, both of which are rather more suitable pastimes for the father of a king than strumming a lyre. It has been suggested that the inspiration for this modification may have come from Persian depictions of kings and satraps, both of whom were frequently depicted enthroned and armed with a bow as on this stator of Datames, the satrap of Cilicia and Cappadocia. Uh, here he's, he's even in, in, in a similar pose testing an arrow. The potential involvement of Persian iconography in the development of Antiochus's Apollo illustrates a new conversation between king and subject that takes into consideration indigenous, non-Greek views of kingship and royal legitimacy. This conversation was still alive in the second century BC, after the Arsacid Parthians had begun their westward advance, conquering all the eastern territories of the Seleucid Empire, including Babylonia, by 132. Parthian drams of the period depict the seated Iranian archer reverse type that had been favored for this denomination since the third century. But he, you can see here, he is now shown seated on Apollo's omphalos rather than on his more usual throne, apparently as an indicator that the Parthian Empire was the inheritor of the Seleucid Empire that came before it. Much as Antiochus's creation of the Seleucid Apollo type reinvented the personal associations of Seleucus as part of an ongoing dynastic storyline, the anchor, which had loomed large as the personal emblem of Seleucus, was also recast as a dynastic symbol. A story reported by Justin, which developed under Antiochus I, or even later, that Seleucus was born with a distinguishing birthmark on his thigh in the shape of an anchor. This anchor birthmark also occurred in the same place on royal descendants of the Seleucid founder as a miraculous indicator of their legitimacy. Thus, the appearance of the anchor on the coins of Seleucus' successors was a way of visually marking themselves out as legitimate members of the dynasty. We have already seen that it continued as the seal of the king in Uruk under Antiochus I, but it also appears on his coins, as in this example, where it serves as a shield device to represent the might of the Seleucid army. A quick search of Seleucid coins online reveals the occurrence of the anchor as both type and subsidiary symbol, sometimes countermarked, on coins of Antiochus II, Seleucus II, Antiochus III, and later kings. 
The anchor was employed as a countermark on posthumous Alexander and autonomous tetradrams of Lycian and Pamphylian mints, probably used to finance the Syrian invasion of Antiochus IV in 175, and sporadically on coins of Alexander Ballas, Demetrius II, Antiochus VII, and Alexander Zabinus in the later second century BC. But after these kings, the symbol disappears from Seleucid royal coinage. As we will see, this is probably due to the conflicts between rival claimants to the throne within the royal house that tore the shrinking Seleucid empire apart in the late second and early first centuries and destroyed the image of a single monolithic ruling dynasty. Before leaving the anchor type and the stories related to it in the Seleucid context, it should be pointed out that it also opened numismatic conversations about power and legitimacy with indigenous non-Greek peoples. For example, when Alexander Janaeus struck coins naming him as king of an independent Hasmonean Jewish kingdom at the beginning of the first century BC, a prominent anchor was placed on the obverse, surrounded by his name and title in Greek. Although this anchor is sometimes associated with Janaeus's conquest of the coastal cities of Koile, Syria in 96, this coinage appears to have been struck over many years and therefore is unlikely to have had a narrow commemorative character. When we consider that the reverse type depicts a star surrounded by a diadem, the latter being a universal symbol of Hellenistic kingship, it seems more than likely that the anchor is intended to cast Janaeus the first Hasmonean to rule as king and strike coins with the royal title as a kind of heir to the last kings to rule over Judea, the Seleucids. The anchor also reappears on coins of the independent kingdom of Elimaeus, which seceded from the Seleucid Empire around 147 BC. Issues of the Elimean kings, produced in the first century BC and AD, regularly feature the old Seleucid emblem behind the royal portrait, apparently advertising the legitimacy of the king as a supposed heir to the Seleucid empire in Elimaeus, or perhaps guaranteeing the value of the coins, as Seleucus had once done with his tetradrams. Evidently, where Seleucus had lost his signet ring centuries before, according to Appian, the rulers of Elimaeus had found it and were more than happy to seal themselves with it. In a third case, the anchor is found on coins of Antiochus IV of Comagony in the first century AD. Here there could be a no doubt that this emblem refers back to the Seleucids and serves to present the king as their legitimate successor. The kings of Comagony, who had claimed independence from the Seleucid Empire since 163 BC, were actually linked to the Seleucid dynasty by the marriage of Mithridates I of Comagony to a daughter of Antiochus VIII in 109 BC. While most of the stories and conversations that we have looked at so far hinge on the theme of belonging, either as a member of the Seleucid dynasty or as its rightful successor, the coinage of the late Seleucid kings tells a different story, that of disintegration and individualism. The Apollo type invented by Antiochus I had given a monolithic appearance to the dynasty and its money through its almost constant repetition on the precious metal and sometimes even the bronze issues down to the reigns of Antiochus III and Seleucus IV. This unified dynastic image began to crack in 173 BC when Antiochus IV introduced a new tetradram series on a reduced weight standard depicting Zeus, his personal divine patron, on the reverse. Although Apollo still appeared at the more conservative Eastern mints in Babylonia, Media, and Susiana, precious metal issues struck by subsequent kings at mints in Cilicia, Syria, and Koile, Syria, are personal rather than dynastic in flavor. This new focus on the individuality of kings rather than their place in the preceding Seleucid tradition is reflective of the bloody conflict between rival branches of the dynasty, as well as with usurpers, 
that characterized Seleucid history in the second and early first centuries BC. Thus, for example, we find Tyche on coins of Demetrius I, Athena on coins of Antiochus VII, and so on. We've already seen that Seleucid coins present a variety of stories and engage in conversations often serving to establish and perpetuate an image of legitimacy for the dynasty. But to me, one of the most interesting conversations recorded by the coins are those related to the relationships between king and city, and especially between king and non-Greek subjects of the empire. The traces of an apparent numismatic conversation involving the Seleucid king and Persian subject has been noted with respect to the development of the dynastic Apollo type under Antiochus I. But this is not the only case in which Seleucid coins suggest some sensitivity towards the customs and concerns of non-Greek peoples. Although Antiochus IV remains infamous among Seleucid kings for his persecution of the Jews of Judea in 167, this coin struck at Jerusalem in the name of Antiochus VII following his capture of the city in 134, seems to illustrate a remarkable respect for Jewish religious custom. Seleucid coins in general tend to depict the portrait of the king and or types related to the polytheistic Greek religion. But here there is no sign of such types, all of which would certainly offend against the Jewish religious prohibition against graven images. Instead of a royal portrait, here Seleucid power and authority are represented in the abstract through the use of the anchor. The lily, a flower associated with the Jewish temple and its priests came to represent, uh, seems to represent Jerusalem, the city in which the coin was issued, or perhaps more likely, John Hyrcanus, the presiding Hasmonean high priest. One suspects that this high level of sensitivity to Jewish religious concerns may not stem entirely from the close attention of the central Seleucid authorities, but also in part from the fact that the coinage was produced in Jerusalem, probably by Jewish dye engravers and under the watchful eye of Hyrcanus. If it were not so, it is difficult to explain why the anchor standing for the royal portrait is relegated to the reverse, while the lily is given priority on the obverse. While the Jerusalem issue of Antiochus VII is easily the most obvious example of deference to local religious and cultural requirements expressed by a Seleucid coin, it may not be the only one. In 121-120, new tetradrams were produced for Antiochus VIII throughout the Seleucid Empire, which by this time consisted only of Syria, Koile Syria, Phoenicia, and parts of Cilicia. These feature a very Greek depiction of Zeus Uranios, standing completely nude while he holds his scepter and a star. However, after only a few years, in 118, the type was redesigned with a more modest image of the god covered up with an anhemation. This remained the standard type for tetradrams of Antiochus VIII until 113, when a new seated and clothed Zeus type was adopted. Since the Greek taste for male nudity was often a cause of consternation for non-Greeks, not least Jews and other Semitic peoples who made up very important segments of the population in the reduced Seleucid Empire, one wonders whether the influence of non-Greek cultural attitudes may lie behind the sudden dressing of Zeus. Indeed, a quick review of the coins in Seleucid coins online reveals that the period from 121 to 118 is the only time that Zeus is ever shown fully nude on a Seleucid coin. This may suggest that Antiochus VIII or his engravers were testing the iconographic waters at the beginning of his reign, but were compelled by a public opinion to adopt a more modest form of Zeus. Interestingly, this apparent numismatic conversation regarding nudity seems to be specific to Zeus or perhaps to the silver denomination. Gods like Apollo and Hermes are still nude as usual on bronze coins struck after the reign of Antiochus VIII, but no deity ever again appears nude on Seleucid silver. The situation contrasts greatly with the situation in the second century BC, 
when the nude image of Seleucid Apollo was ubiquitous on the precious metal coinage, and the empire still contained large swaths of Asia Minor with its many Greek cities. These two apparent cases of cultural conversations from the reigns of Antiochus VII and VIII actually grow out of a larger discussion of the relationship between king and city that begins in very muted tones in Western Asia Minor in the third century BC. For example, although it carries the portrait and name of Antiochus II, as well as the dynastic Apollo type, the grazing horse civic badge of Alexandria Troas, which you can see here, seems to muddy the question of authority for the omission. The main types tell the story of royalty, but the grazing horse tells the story of the city. When the same civic emblem occurs on posthumous Alexander tetradrams, no one hesitates to describe these as civic issues. Thus, in the case of Seleucid royal types with civic emblems, we are left to wonder whether they should be seen as royal coins whose production was imposed on the cities, civic coins making use of royal types for their own ends, or whether there is some kind of shared involvement in production here. The competing stories offered by royal types and civic emblems and the ambiguity that they create would seem to represent the ongoing conversation and ne negotiation between Seleucid ruler and subject cities over the limits of power. This subtle and rather muted conversation begins to grow louder after the conquest of Phoenicia and Koile Syria by Antio Antiochus III in 198, when the city of Tyre was opened as a Seleucid mint for the first time. Bronze issues struck there for Antiochus III and his successors down to Demetrius II all feature parts of galleys or palm trees rather than Seleucid royal types on the reverse. The galley types refer to the city's importance as a naval center, while the palm tree, Phoenix in Greek, is a punning emblem for the region of Phoenicia. This numismatic conversation involving the king and Tyre expanded and grew even louder in the mid second century BC under Antiochus IV and Alexander Ballas, when additional cities in Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia struck bronze coins with the royal portrait on the obverse but a civic type on the reverse, as well as the name of the city. In some cases, as on this issue of Syrian Apamea, even the name of the king was dropped, almost giving the impression of a dispute over the authority responsible for the coinage. It had both civic and royal qualities at the same time. It is difficult to see the difference between coins like this and the later provincial coinages of the Roman Empire which regularly featured the imperial portrait on the obverse and a civic type on the reverse. By the late second and early first centuries, the discourse between king and city began to spill over from the bronze coinage and onto silver at cities like Tarsus and Malus in Cilicia and Damascus in Koile, Syria. Interestingly, these civic reverses commonly depict indigenous non-Greek deities again pointing to the increased influence of, or increased attention paid to non-Greek peoples in the late Seleucid period. For example, at Tarsus, we find tetradrams and drams struck with reverses depicting Sandan, an old Hittite storm god who was regularly depicted standing on the back of a lion griffin. An annual festival at Tarsus involved the burning of his cult image on a monumental funeral pyre. At Malus, the coins depict the cult image of the local deity Athena Magarsia, who has the columnar form of an indigenous Anatolian or Syrian goddess, but attributes like helmet, spear, and aegis that are appropriate to her Greek namesake. Two local Syrian deities, Atergatus and her consort Hadad, appear on tetradram struck for Demetrius III and Antiochus XII at Damascus. Considering the increase in civic reverse types on Seleucid coins in the late second and early first centuries that we have seen, and the evident conversation between king and city that it represents, it may raise questions about the enthroned Zeus type 
that came to dominate the reverse of tetradrams struck at Antioch from the reign of Antiochus X to the end of the dynasty in 64 BC. Should this depiction of Zeus be considered a royal type or is it civic, referring to Antioch's much ornamented and occasionally plundered temple dedicated to the god? When bronze coinage depicting and naming the Seleucid king ceased production at Antioch in 94 BC, it was immediately replaced by a civic coinage naming Antioch as the metropolis of Syria and featuring the same Zeus reverse as on the tetradrams. In addition to these ongoing political and cultural conversations between city and king and non-Greek and Greek recorded on Seleucid coins, a related parallel conversation also went on between the cities of Phoenicia in the second century BC. This is really remarkable because the cities virtually disregard the royal and traditional Greek character of the coins in order to advertise themselves and jockey for position using legends written in Phoenician. Thus, only Phoenicians or other West Semitic peoples or the rare Greek who had learned Phoenician could actually read these legends. Beginning under Antiochus IV, cities like Beritus, shown here, which had been refounded as Laodicea in Phoenicia, and Byblos, advertised themselves in Phoenician script, the former as Laodicea, which is in Canaan, and the latter as Gabal the Holy. Gabal, of course, was the native Phoenician name for Byblos. It is unclear whether the city is described as holy here because it had received this status through a royal grant or whether it was holy in more general terms because it was an important center for the cult of Atargatis. I tend to suspect that because the title of holy is only ever given in Phoenician script and never written in Greek, that this was a kind of unofficial holiness that was not connected to a royal grant of privilege. The Phoenician coin legends at Laodicea in Phoenicia and Byblos are fairly innocuous statements of civic identity. But there is a real shift in tone when Tyre enters the conversation in 169-168, using the legend of Tyre, the mother of the Sidonians. This was an obvious slap in the face to Sidon, Tyre's competitor as the most important city in Phoenicia, not least because previously, in the Persian period, Sidon had served as the administrative capital of the region. Although most coins of Sidon follow the pattern of Byblos and Laodicea in Phoenicia, with the simple Phoenician legend of the Sidonians, it was impossible to ignore the Tyrian affront. And therefore, on one series of bronze coins, probably struck not long after the Tyrian issue, the Phoenician ish legend reads, of the Sidonians, the mother of Cambe, Hipponae, Kitium, and Tyre. This is a very clear escalation. Whereas the Tyrians claim to be the founders of Sidon, here the Sidonians claim to have founded not only Tyre, but all of that city's colonies. Cambe is a name for the more familiar Carthage, Hippone is Hippo Regius in North Africa, and Kition is the important Phoenician city on Cyprus. This Sidonian response to the Tyrian legend is notable not only for its virulence, but also for the way that it dominates the entirety of the reverse type. As if it is, not, it is really only incidental that it is supposed to be part of a Seleucid coin. Sidon has completely hijacked the coin for its own civic and regional ends, whereas the Tyrian claim is somewhat more respectful of Seleucid numismatic tradition in squeezing its claim in below the reverse type and by retaining the usual Greek legends naming the king and city. One suspects that the royal authorities may have stepped in to curb the exuberance of Tyre and Sidon in their Phoenician legends. Such extreme competition could have very negative effects and lead to intercity violence, as actually did happen in the Roman period. After the reign of Antiochus IV, Seleucid coins of Sidon and Tyre only carry very basic Phoenician legends, indicating that they are issues of the Sidonians or of Tyre which suggests some degree of chastisement for the earlier behavior of the cities on the coinage. The final conversation of the Seleucid Empire, with some reflection on coinage, 
revolves around the question of what happens to a dynastic tradition when the kings who embodied it had virtually ceased to rule over anything. The territorial extent of the empire had been shrinking noticeably since the third century BC, when the eastern satrapies of Bactria and Parthia seceded, but it became increasingly constricted after 188, when the Peace of Apamea imposed by the Romans on Antiochus III formally excluded the Seleucids from Asia Minor, north of the Taurus Mountains. The situation worsened in the 130s, when the entirety of Media, Susiana, and Babylonia was permanently lost to the Parthians. The constant warfare between rival Seleucid kings and usurpers in the late second and early first centuries BC compelled rulers to grant autonomy to cities and allowed for the rise of Jewish, Nabataean, and Iturian ethnic states, all of which further ate away at the extent of Seleucid territory. By the 80s BC, Seleucid kings controlled very little outside of the immediate environs of Antioch and Damascus, and the last, latter was finally lost to the Nabataean Arabs in 84-83. The situation for the kings worsened further when Syria was dragged into the Third Mithridatic War by Tigranes the Great, the father-in-law and ally of Mithridates VI of Pontus. In 72 BC, Tigranes invaded Syria, possibly at the invitation of the Antiochenes, hunted down and killed the Seleucid queen, Cleopatra Selene, and occupied Antioch and Damascus, while Cleopatra's son, Antiochus XIII, escaped to safety in Cilicia. After the defeat of Tigranes by the Roman forces of L. Licinius Lucullus in 68 BC, Lucullus placed Antiochus XIII on the throne in Antioch. Unfortunately, the new king was deeply unpopular with the Antiochenes, who repeatedly tried to depose him, both on their own and with the help of Arab chieftains. With the Mithridatic War drawn to a close, in 64 BC, Pompey the Great arrived in Syria as part of his tour to settle the affairs of the regions involved in the conflict. Antiochus XIII asked Pompey to confirm him as king, but the Roman commander refused, either because he had been bribed by the Antiochenes to do so, or because he recognized him as singularly unsuitable for the job. As a solution, Pompey decided to end the Seleucid kingship entirely and reorganize Syria as a Roman province. As with most provinces established under the Roman Republic, no effort was made to introduce the denarius or otherwise displace local coinages of Syria with something more explicitly provincial or Roman. However, when the administration of Syria first turned its attention to producing new coinage for the province, it took for its model the previous royal tetradrams of the late Seleucid king, Philip Philadelphus. And here we can see a posthumous Philip tetradram signed by none other than Aulus Gabinius, serving as the governor of Syria. You can see his monogram right here. There's been some discussion regarding why the Romans chose the types of Philip Philadelphus rather than Antiochus XIII as the model for the new coins. One might have expected the latter, since he was actually the last Seleucid king to strike coins. The usual explanation is ideological and based on Pompey's apparent disdain for Antiochus XIII. It is usually assumed that because Pompey did not recognize Antiochus XIII, the Romans thus considered his predecessor at Antioch, Philip Philadelphus, to have been the last legitimate Seleucid king. But the reality is probably much more pragmatic. Faced with increasing financial constraint from constant intra-dynastic warfare and the drastic shrinking of the empire's borders, after 88 BC, Philip Philadelphus lowered the already reduced weight of the Seleucid tetradram of the first century from 16 grams to 15.65 grams and produced a new coinage on a massive scale compared to his immediate predecessors, suggesting that he had recalled earlier coins for restriking. This is also suggested by the fact that almost all known hordes from the reign of Philip Philadelphus after 88 BC consist only of his reduced weight tetradrams. Thus, despite the brief production of tetradrams involving two obverse dyes under Antiochus XIII in 57 BC, the most common silver coin 
circulating in Syria would have been Philip's tetradrams. For the sake of easy acceptance, therefore, it would have made the most sense for the Roman authorities to imitate the coinage of, of Philip than of Antiochus XIII. The Romans had previously encountered a civil, similar situation in the Attalid Kingdom, which became the Roman province of Asia in 129 BC. There, all earlier adequate coinage had been replaced by the light Sistiforic tetradram during the reigns of Attalus II and Attalus III, meaning that this was the only silver denomination in circulation. Therefore, when the provincial authorities of Asia began to produce new coinage there in the 50s BC, they also return, retained the earlier types, but added their own names, just as in Roman Syria in the same period. Thank you for joining me today for this Seleucid numismatic story time. I hope that it has illustrated for you some of the many tales that Seleucid coins tell and the variety of conversations in which they engage. Some speak with voices that are loud and clear, while others may whisper and require some knowledge of how to listen in order to understand what they are saying. At the same time that they tell their own stories, the coins also provide numerous strands and subplots that contribute to the larger rich story of the Seleucid Empire as a whole. All of this is what makes Seleucid numismatics such an exciting area of study. And I dare say that as Seleucid Coins Online continues to develop, even more stories and conversations will be overheard. Thank you. Yeah, I just am um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, the, the Ptolemies famously um, uh, imitate or use the, the portrait of the, the founder on almost all of their tetradrams. And why do you think the Seleucids um, primarily use their own portraits when they minted their coins all over? Just curious if you have any idea about that. I, I don't have... They, they're, they see the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, I think, from the beginning, they both had two different ways of trying to you know, present a kind of monolithic image of their dynasties. You know, for the Seleucids, it's the repetition, it's the constant repetition of the Apollo until things, you know, until things fall apart in the, in the second century. Whereas with the Ptolemies, it's always, it's always uh, uh, Ptolemy the first on the, uh, on the obverse. I think they're, they're aiming at. They have similar aims, but they're they're different. They're different approaches, and this, the Seleucid approach is, I think, is is a little bit more personalized because they still throw the portrait on, but there's still the element of creating this universal Seleucid dynastic image going on. Um, if you're ready for another question, sure. Uh, I, I uh, have note that uh, there's not very many gold Seleucid coins, and I know there's a particular one of Antiochus the sixth that you refer to in the, in your books that uh, what used to be in a museum it sort of disappeared. I, I have what I think is a forgery. I'm going to just show this up where my face is. Can, can, can you is this a good enough picture that you can see what that is? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm curious, with this particular coin, are there many forgeries of, you know, Antiochus the Sixth, and, uh, or are there any real, are there any ones that are authentic that you would know of? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I don't, do we, I don't remember if we, li if we, we list anything like this. Well, you made reference to, you didn't actually picture anything because it, 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 there was one that disappeared from a museum collection and then is not. Oh, is that the one from Poland? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I don't know uh, where this came from. I bought it from Elwood Raffin, who is deceased at this time, but he used to collect Seleucid coins. And yeah, the, the portrait looks funny in this. Yeah, and, and, and the there's no letters for a date. There's an A underneath, and the A looks way too um, 
just natural, it, it, not the way the Seleucids, you know, would have maybe right. done it. But um, uh, so you see, so I, I, I would think it would be kind of hard to pass a forgery of something that never got minted in the first place. But uh, have you, you ever seen these before floating around? I have, I have not. I have not actually seen this. Seen this before. But you know, someone could also be, someone could also be making these because they know that there originally was one in in the Polish museum that was lost or destroyed, and yeah. they're they're filling in a hole. For yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thank you. That, yeah, thank you. Uh, oh. Oh, here's a question from, from Uta here. Uh, well, how how sure are we that this is Zeus on the Antiochus the Eighth issue? Yes, yeah, so uh, Damascus, right? Where yep. of course in that part of the world, um, you know, the classic depiction is Baal, and of course, you know, the whole tradition we think of Su Alexander comes to this, and when you see this sort of crescent above the head. Um, which is, again, something one, one associates much more with Baal. The question really then is whether the nudity aspect is that there is more that they're turning actually that this is how it would be understood. I mean, are we not reading too much Greek maybe into, um, in particular, these the mints in that part of the world here? Uh, maybe. I, I, would just, I would just emphasize that even though the examples that I showed were of Damascus, those those types were also uh, used at Antioch and and in Cilicia as well. So it was it was a, a more uni, more universal. Um, uh, no, uh, okay. Can you comment on Seleucids popping up later in history? Scholars believe that Avidius Cassius, a Roman general who tried unsuccessfully to usurp Marcus Aurelius, was descended from Antiochus the Fourth. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know of any other later ones. Um, no, not, no. And is it, is it actually Antiochus the fourth of Syria or is it Antiochus the fourth of, uh, Comagony? Uh, I don't, I don't know the source. Oliver, it's uh, Burley, who's one of the people who's done biographies of Marcus Aurelius, say it's the uh, Seleucid one. Okay. You don't know where he got that information. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I don't know any any others. Yeah. Although it, I I can tell you that the 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 leader of the uh, uh, the great uh, Sicilian uh, slave revolt took as his name Antiochus, mm -hmm. uh, but he is surely of no relation to, to the actual king. Um, but other, 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 later, other later figures claiming descent, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, Warren Esty, <laughs> which handbook volume will come up next? <clears throat> well, uh, I'm finishing up the one for uh, Northwestern Asia Minor right now. Uh, hopefully... Hopefully at the end of the summer or early early fall. It's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know. They're also good. Uh, now, actually, one of one of my one of my favorite coins is that that large anchor tetradram of uh, Demetrius the second that the ANS has. It's 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 just fa the reverse on it is fabulous. The obverse is a little bit. Not not that great, but the reverse is really, it really says it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hear something from Katie. What was what your sense of how much the average consumer of coinages would be aware of the competition and conversation between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies? Uh, probably not much. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this is this is something that went on, but it wasn't. I'm I'm not sure that the the average coin user in the street would have been aware. But uh, I think the time I think the time the timing shows that people in the mint or or Seleucus were were aware and 
so that this this was going on. Uh, Oliver, can you comment on uh, the coins of Antiochus the second when the reverse switches from Apollo to Heracles seated? What the reason for that was? That is one of those open questions. Um, <laughs> uh, that may that be may may be another case of uh, you know local influence. Uh, on on the development of the the coinage in in Western Asia Minor, um, because that's kind of a weird blip that happens and then it then it's gone and yeah I don't I don't think I don't think uh, we are right to see in it the uh, tiredness of uh, Antiochus the second after a long reign fighting against the the Ptolemies and. Uh, uh, Everything else, as as you sometimes see in the old in the old literature. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. Well, anyone else have any questions? I guess we can probably wrap it up then. Thank you, Oliver. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. A good little wave at the end. <laughs> thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for the great talk, all the books, and all the work you do. I frankly don't know how it was the two books, uh, the big Seleucid coin books or whatever, uh, and then the, the series of the handbook. Um, I, I, you know, I, I spent the last 20 years just cataloging my own little collection and it never ends. So I don't know how you can possibly catalog it all, but thank you for doing it, okay? Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. And just so you guys know, this one will be recorded and available on YouTube by next week sometime. So thank you. Thanks. Bye.